You may think that you're on top and that your life is going well. And it could be, but that could stop. Jihadis want to make your life a hell. So be alert and be aware and tell the truth, just like Mar Mari Emmanuel. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This Week in Jihad is back and better than ever. And we are here with the great, the one, the only, the doctor, the David, the Wood. Hello, David. Hey, how you doing, Robert? David, I am well, thank God. I have been traveling all over the place and running around all over this fair land, telling people about jihad and not telling, not talking about it with you. And so hmm. I think, uh, well, let's do it again tonight. We'll talk more jihad and get right back into it. Of course, as I noted in my inaugural somewhat clumsy return to form poem we had a reference as you may have noted as alert literary critics will have noted you may have noticed that i mentioned a certain marmari emmanuel of the assyrian church of the east a popular and well-known preacher in australia and i understand that you have done you and ap and inspiring philosophy have been talking about this so why don't you fill in our viewing audience over here? Yeah, so I wasn't really, I wasn't familiar with uh, Bishop Marmari Emmanuel. I, I know I had seen him, but he was basically, he's popular, he was really popular on TikTok. He's really popular on TikTok where people were taking his clips. And he talks about Islam quite a bit. Uh, and not just, not just to be mean, he's, I mean, he's, uh, He's presenting the theological problems with Islam's view of Jesus, and he does this regularly in his sermons, which are uh, which are live streamed. Um, I just pulled up, I pulled up a couple of random uh, random sermons, and he regularly he regularly includes uh, some uh, some details about Muhammad and the Quran. Again, especially especially uh, bringing out difficulties with what Islam teaches about Jesus. He points out the inconsistencies. He's basically, he's basically pointing out that the, ex, the extreme uniqueness of Jesus in Islam makes no sense from an Islamic perspective. It makes sense from a Christian perspective with Jesus being the word of Allah and a spirit proceeding from Allah and Jesus being born of a virgin and uh, Jesus living the most miraculous life in history and Jesus being the Messiah and Allah allowing Muhammad to die, but not allow Jesus to die, and Jesus coming back to judge and so on. He says, this makes no sense for Jesus to be unique in all these ways. And uh, he had apparently been threatened. I'm not, I'm not sure about the contents of the threats against him, but there was a video of him uh, saying that people had been pointing out that he has two weeks to live, and uh, he laughed it off and you know, said he'll, he'll be happy for, for anyone to send him to see Jesus. And... Um, and he uh, he can be pretty. Um, he's pointed out that he had some sort of uh, mystical vision or something like that of heaven, and he's pointing out that uh, Muhammad wasn't there. And he's been saying some of these things in very popular, very popular live streams and podcasts and so on. And so people were ticked off at him. Then uh, someone walked up to him, and uh, apparently it was a, it was some sort of flip knife. Where the blade flips out, and it didn't uh, didn't pop out correctly. And so the guy ended up, a uh, 16-year-old guy started, uh, in injured his own hand. And when we hear about someone getting stabbed during a church service and so on, you know where our minds go. You know where our minds go. There are always other possibilities. It could be a crazy person. It could be a, some, uh, uh, some very anti-Christian person. Um, could be some disgruntled uh, member of a competing sect or someone that just hated this guy it could 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 be anything but you know if you had to if you had to wager you'd be thinking jihad especially with a guy who regularly criticizes islam and uh, so anyway the guy came in there and uh, apparently was yelling allahu akbar and they actually questioned him while they were holding him down and he was saying well if you know if he hadn't been uh offending my prophet i wouldn't have had to do this so let's yeah, that's where it, it, uh... That's where it becomes kind of open and shut that yeah. uh, this was a jihadi because whose prophet, what prophet would anybody be offended enough to stab someone for except for our friend Mo? 
Yeah, and even after that information was out, there were Muslims running with the claim that this is actually a Jew. It was a Jew. Yeah, a, you know, it was a Jew who's upset at upset at uh, who's upset at uh, uh, Bishop Marmari for being anti-Zionist, which he isn't. They're, they're they're talking about a clip where they're talking about a clip where he he. He says, "Hey, we, you know, we should we should be showing compassion towards the towards the Palestinians, and the Palestinians are kids who are getting hurt, and you know, we should we should uh, we should uh, be we should be really careful here and be taking this seriously." Uh, but he also has other videos talking about how he loves Jews and, um, and 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 God has a plan for Jews and so and so. He seems to he seems to be pretty balanced. He seems to be pretty balanced. So the idea that uh, this enraged Mossad so much. <laughs> <laughs> this guy, this guy down here in Australia, yeah, we got to go get him. Send in the sixteen-year-old with the broken knife. Well, it's just part of the uh, Jew hatred that we've seen come out so openly since October seventh, and I saw it all over Twitter the last couple of days uh, because I reported, of course, that it was uh, a Muslim screaming Allahu Akbar, which he was according to eyewitness accounts, the guy who actually stopped him from stabbing Marmari Emanuel and held him down said, yeah, he kept saying Allahu Akbar. And then as you noted, he uh, also repeated that uh, he had uh, done it because Marmari Emanuel had insulted his prophet. He was very happy, as you can see, he's grinning here, when he was apprehended, which is in, uh, in line with what we often see from Islamic jihadis that nobody ever talks about, of course, except us, that uh, the uh, jihadis are often happy after they commit horrific acts of violence because they believe they've pleased Allah. And so uh, it was remarkable. There were a whole lot of uh, Muslims on Twitter saying to me, he did not say Allahu Akbar. It was not in the video where he stabbed him because, of course, this was on a live stream of the divine liturgy in this church and he was stabbed right in the middle of it and many 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 of the muslims were saying he did not say allahu akbar whereas you can actually hear there's a malay after he starts stabbing the the the, the bishop and there is uh, a great deal of talk but you can definitely hear him saying allahu akbar and of course then there's the witness who said that he said allahu akbar and uh then there were all these people saying, the Jews say Allahu Akbar. To I, I was about to, I was just about to ask you that. I was just about to ask you. <laughs> I was about to say, hey, Robert, have you seen these people saying, well, maybe it's Jews shouting Allahu Akbar? Yeah. yeah. I, I should have been working. I'm, I'm writing a book and I should have been working on it. But a lot of times when uh, it's not really going so great, then I go and, and, and engage these idiots at Twitter just for some fun and uh I, I asked like five or ten people can you give me one example of this ever happening of any non-muslim ever saying allahu akbar in committing an act of violence and much less doing it in order to make islam look bad but this was something many many people repeated and the whole thing they said was uh of course done by Mossad. yes to discredit islam yeah and not the uh not the obvious. Notice every single time it's, hey, go with the least obvious interpretation of the evidence and just stay glued to that forever. Yes. Uh, isn't it amazing? I mean, I mean, you got a guy, again, criticizes Islam regularly. And what's amazing is I've seen Muslims saying, well, he should have kept his mouth shut, shouldn't have been talking about Islam. Why can't he just talk about his own religion? This guy's a Syrian. These guys were actually genocided. These guys, I don't mean, I don't mean the, oh, people were going after terrorists hiding in tunnels. And I don't mean that kind of genocide. In other words, what genocide means now. I mean, actual genocide, round up everyone of that background because we're, we're exterminating them and taking their stuff and taking their land and so on. So, yeah, the Assyrians, the Armenians, guys, these, these are Sini, uh, are Assyrians, Armenians, Jews, the guys, they're actual victims of genocide out there. This guy's group is one of them. And uh, it's just amazing that he's supposed to keep his mouth shut about Islam permanently when, I mean, he's actually, he's, he's doing it to preach the gospel to Muslims. And like, uh, my goodness, it, uh, the, the level of hypocrisy. So on the one hand, you got the, that Assyrians historically have been targeted by jihadis, even for complete extermination. But then again, you have 
if you want to say, oh, but, you know, people should just look back, not not criticize other people's beliefs. Dudes, look at your prophet. He started all this. He's the one he's the one who's saying constantly criticizing other people and saying that other people have to be violently subjugated and even exterminated in the case of Jews. And the moment you say, no, actually, don't do that. Why are you attacking our religion? My goodness, what a bunch of coward crybabies. Yep. Uh, let's see. I've been asked to mic up. Oh, I think I did something wrong. Here. Uh, yes, there we go. That should help. I hope. Anyway, um, there's a whole lot of other jihad here this week, David. Did you see this guy? I saw a picture. Uh, I do not recall who that is. This is Alexander Scott Mercurio, and he is from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And hotbed, hotbed of jihad. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> In Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I don't know hey, what he should have been doing. That's picking that's potatoes. ISIS. That's ISIS I there. Yes, I Idaho. We got, ISIS, we got state. ISIS K. We got ISIS uh, ISIS I. The the, the potato, Islamic potato. state of Idaho and Salem, Oregon, ISIS. Uh, so in uh, Idaho, in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Alexander Scott Mercurio converted to Islam, as you can see. And he became a fan of ISIS. And he plotted, he was going to, on uh, April 7th, I believe it was. Um, hey, my birthday. Is that right? Well, he was going to yep. celebrate David Wood's birthday by attacking all 21 churches in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. This is an ambitious young man here, David. Yeah, not, not my kind of party, though. Yeah, that's right. But he was going to, he says, stop close by the church, equip the weapons, and storm the temple. Kill as many people as possible before they inevitably disperse and scatter. Then burn the temple to the ground and flee the scene. Now, Alexander Scott Mercurio evidently thinks there aren't any police in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Because or any, he or thought any he armed gonna, people. Or any armed people. Because he was going to do this, he was going to repeat this 20 times and actually commit mass murder for Allah in all 21 of these churches. And so uh, he got stopped, unfortunately, yeah. uh, for him, but fortunately for everybody in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Yeah, uh, Robert, I mean, you, you'd think this guy would be looking at uh, the recent track record. It's like, okay, guy tried to attack Bishop Mar Mari and... Uh, Ended up ch chopping his own hand up because he couldn't get the knife to work right. Like, okay, knives aren't rocket science here. I understand someone who's never used a gun tries to shoot a gun, know how to take the safety off. I understand that. If you can't get a knife to work, okay, you probably, you, you, Allah's picking the wrong, Allah's not picking the top brass here. You know, we're not getting the best and brightest here. Um, and, then you had, and then you had Iran, of course. You had Iran. We will bring israel to its knees with our volley of our powerful missiles and uh oh this stuff doesn't work anymore they don't work at all it seems like there comes a point shouldn't there come a point where muslims are just like maybe allah is not on our side we keep trying this stuff and looking like idiots and when we're at all successful in an attack like october 7th then it's massive backlash and all we do all we can do about it is whine and cry for the for the next uh next year I mean, there should come a point when you, I mean, if you're thinking Allah is on your side to subjugate the world and you just keep getting slapped in the face and slapped in the mouth and punched in the mouth and kicked in the gut and kicked in the balls and there's nothing you can do that actually works, it seems like you should be rethinking your theology at some point. But that's just me. Maybe, yeah, maybe Allah is not so all powerful as all that. Uh, but they're still at it. They're still hoping for it in uh, Dearborn, Michigan where you may have heard about this rally. Now, this was a little over a week ago, but uh, it's still in the news uh, this week. And so uh, since we haven't been around, just in case anybody hasn't heard this, this is a photo from a rally that was on International Al-Quds Day, which was Friday, April 5th. And uh, on Al-Quds Day, the, the, uh, this is a, a, a commemoration of the Nakba, the uh, catastrophe, so-called, the founding of the state of Israel. 
and the Ayatollah Khomeini started Al Quds Day back in the uh, early '80s, I believe it was. And it's every year; it's just a hate Israel fest. Now it's spread worldwide, and so they had it in Dearborn, Michigan. And while this clown Tarek Bazi was speaking, the crowd starts to chant "Al Maut Li Amrika," uh, "Death to America." And he doesn't say, oh, no, heavens to Betsy, this is America. We are all patriotic Americans. Uh, he doesn't say a word. He just keeps on actually attacking America and going on with his speech. So uh, a few days ago, Abdullah Hamoud, uh, this gentleman here, who is the mayor of Dearborn, he said, Dearborn is full of patriotic Americans who <laughs> love this country. What do you think, yeah. David? You've been in Dearborn. Yeah, I've been in Dearborn. Hey, isn't that where they locked me up because I was standing there holding a camera while my friend was uh, answering questions from some, some teenager? <laughs> they locked us up. Yes, I don't know where that guy was recording. Uh, I know the Dearborn jail pretty well. Me and the Dearborn jail are like this, son. Of course, <laughs> once it went up to uh, court outside of Dearborn, they had to uh, they had they got sued and they had to pay some money for what they did. But. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it's, it's absolutely amazing. I mean, I mean, it, it. You can't say we haven't been warning them. We've been telling them. We we were telling them back, and we were telling them in like two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Guys, you need to pay attention to what's going on in Dearborn because these guys, these guys are. Uh, and we're told what? No, they're they're the most patriotic Muslims in the world. You even ma remember remember they made that show All American Muslim. Oh yeah, they made yeah, a TV show about, about Muslims in Dearborn. All American Muslims; these are the biggest patriots in the world. And all of a sudden, uh, here we are, a few years later. Death to America! Death to America! Death to America! What? What's going on here? Who could have foreseen this? I don't know <laughs> anyone. <laughs> and you know what's amazing is Abdullah Hamoud, the mayor of Dearborn, did not say, "I'm going to start an investigation immediately into subversive activity in Dearborn." and root out these people who are working uh, for death to America. He didn't say anything like that. He just said, we're all supposed to believe now that Dearborn is full of patri patriotic waivers of the stars and stripes. And, yeah. Uh, if, he, yeah. if he says, if he has any follow-up, it'll be warnings about the dangers of Islamophobia and that he's starting a new anti-Islamophobia task force. That's right, David. You know, I had forgotten, but... Just a few weeks ago, you may recall, there was a big expose in the Wall Street Journal that was called Dearborn, America's Jihad Capital. And it was all about yeah. how the, it was it's written by Stephen Stalinsky of the Me Middle East Media Research Institute, Memory. And he, he had all kinds of evidence of all this uh, uh, collaboration with groups that are linked to terrorism uh, a pray, open praise of Hamas and Hezbollah, all kinds of things going on. And what did Abdullah Hamoud do in response? He said, I'm increasing police patrols around mosques because of this terrible Islamophobia in the Wall Street Journal. He did not say, oh, people think we're America's jihad capital. I'm going to start rooting out jihad activity in Dearborn. He never said anything like that. Interesting. And guys, this has been going on for a while. Um, I'll go ahead and point it out again here. Uh, I didn't hear this from the man, uh, Nabil and Paul, who were locked up in the jail with me. They heard it from the guy who was taking our mug shots. So we had our mug shots taken uh, separately, like Nabil goes in there, then they bring me in there after that, then they bring, uh, then they bring Paul in there, they get the mug shots. And um, Anyway, the next morning, Nabil and Paul, the guy told Nabil and Paul separately the, the same thing when they were pointing out, hey, what, what's going on here in this city where we're having a, a peaceful conversation on a, public on a public street with some Muslims who approached us and started asking us questions. It was all friendly. And then you guys show up and, and lock us up and say it's breach of peace. What's going on here? Uh, seems like Sharia. Seems like a little like Sharia. And uh, the guy who was taking the mug shots told, these, told Nabil and Paul separately. He said, uh, "Hey, you don't have to tell me. I've been on the I've been on the crime scene where a teenage girl gets her uh, gets her uh, her head's chopped off because she went out wearing the wrong thing, and we don't hear a word about it. It never makes it to the media, so don't tell me." And so this is the kind of stuff that's going on in Dearborn, Michigan, 
and uh, and and shame on us, shame on us for being so Islamophobic that we point out obvious problems. But no, so we'll just have to keep quiet about the whole death to America thing, and there's, because there's no way, ladies and gentlemen, there's no way that this could ever lead to anything bad in the future. That's right. And meanwhile, our elected officials are on it. Uh, let's see, where is she? There she is, uh, Rashida Tlaib, the uh, famed. Muslim congresswoman from from Michigan. She said uh, she was asked by a Fox reporter to condemn the death to America chants in Dearborn. And she said, I don't talk to Fox News. You're all racists and all that. And so uh, she never did get around to condemning the death to America chants. The wrong people were asking her. Nasty right wing people. And so uh, she didn't feel incumbent upon her to answer. Meanwhile, we have this gentleman, this guy, David, this guy is Chris Halali from the Party of Communists, USA. And you can see that he's wearing a Palestinian jihad scarf there. And he made a speech not too long ago where he said a very interesting thing in terms of the leftist Islamic alliance. He said that... Uh, Celebrating 100 years since the passing of Comrade Vladimir Lenin is an important milestone. It's an opportunity for us to regroup, rethink, criticize, and self-criticize, and to rebuild and keep the struggle going. And so a century after, a century under the banner of Lenin, let me say that again, I'm sorry. And so after a century under the banner of Lenin, I believe that the next century will be under that banner, and that banner is not only the symbol of Palestine. It is the symbol of all oppressed people. So he's saying we've been fighting as Leninists for the last century, and now we're going to start fighting as Palestinians and as defenders of the allegedly oppressed Palestinians. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, that's interesting. In light of the uh, <clears throat> leftist Islamic alliance, what usually happens to the left in the Islamic alliance there, David? Yeah, they eventually usually uh, get crushed. Indeed. Uh, you remember up. the Ayatollah Khomeini, and he was allying with the Tudeh party in Iran, the communists there. They thought they'd have a part in his government, and instead he threw them all in prison. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, just, just notice, the, notice the similar method. So you had Marxists in the U.S. realize that they could have a kind of shield for their Marxist intentions if they call their group Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> They were, they, were, they were an openly Marxist group. But if we portray ourselves as just defending the victims here and not people who want a Marxist takeover of the country, uh, then people can't criticize us, right? Because if you just walk up to people saying, hey, we're a bunch of Marxists and we're defending Marxism, they're like, ah, get away from here. Uh, but if you go out there and you say, hey, I'm, I'm defending this, uh, this oppressed group, then, uh, then, oh, we can't criticize, they can't criticize the Marxists anymore because now they have a shield. And so, yeah, why wouldn't you? If you're a Marxist, why wouldn't you do? that with uh with uh with the palestinian cause now just say you're all about defending palestinians indeed but i'll tell you david this is getting out of hand here uh had, did you see this uh let me find her oh i know i've got her here did you see this this lady oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that is riddhi patel who is not a muslim but a hindu but uh she's far to the left and she showed up oh, yeah. and uh at the uh, city council meeting in Bakersfield, California. And in Bakersfield, she said that uh, the Bakersfield city council had to endorse the, uh, the uh, ceasefire in Israel, that is allowing Hamas to survive. And uh, she also was objecting to the fact that there were metal detectors at the city council meeting. And in order to register her objection to the metal detectors at the city council meeting, she said, uh, you guys want to criminalize us with metal detectors. We'll see you at your house. We'll murder you. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's, what's interesting is you can, she appeared before that and she asked, actually escalated because her earlier comments were, um, 
I hope you guys die or I hope you guys get killed or something like that. That's not actually probably a crime to say I hope you die or something like that. That's not that's not a specific threat. Um, but she got away with that and there were no problems. <clears throat> so the next time she got up, she said, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see you at your house. We're going to kill you all. And then she got she got 18 felony charges. Uh, eight of them are like uh, 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 pu- one part of them wa- is trying to intimidate a public official and the other were were terrorism charges, making terrorist threats. And so, my goodness, uh, I mean, this was this is California, right? Yeah. Bakersfield, California. Oh, OK, this is California. So they'll probably give her some sort of plea deal where she spends a year in prison and gets like a five year sentence. But I mean, if she were actually tried and convicted of all the which she could be if they wanted to. I'm just saying because because it's California, they probably won't go after her as hard as they can. And they'll want to cut her a deal because they Indeed. don't want to, they don't want to enrage other people. And then there's all sorts of free free this woman protests and so on. So they'll probably give her some sort of deal. She'll probably spend six months or a year or something like that locked up. But uh, I mean, my goodness, multiple counts of making terrorists a threat, terrorist threats against public officials. If they wanted to throw the book at her, she'd be spending life in prison. And I would lose minutes of sleep over that, Robert. Minutes. <laughs> and indeed, you know, she was weeping after she was uh, so uh, hostile and so out there at tough. the meeting. Yeah, she, she was, was tough. Weeping pathetically when she was arrested and pleading and so on. And uh, I think what's really remarkable about this is the fact that she is a Hindu. And we've covered so many stories here, and there's so many others, about uh, the the persecution of Hindus by Muslims mm-hmm. in India itself, as well as in Bangladesh and Pakistan. And yet, uh, here you have somebody who doesn't probably even realize that Mm -hmm. when she's defending the Palestinians and Hamas, she's really fronting for the same jihad that threatens her own people in India. Yeah, and really, I mean, just online and with uh, people in the the chat and on, on Twitter and so on, usually when I'm hearing from people for from India, it's people who say they stand with Israel on this issue because they've been they've experienced it. They they've yeah. experienced jihad over there. And you can say, hey, I disagree with this or I, I disagree with Israel about that. I disagree with Israel about this. I disagree with how you did this. But when they're when they're just basically taking a side, it's we are not on the side of the terrorists because we've we've been through that too many times and we understand what that is. And I mean, they're kind of they're kind of parallels between like Hindus and Jews a bit in that they're not like they're not big on proselytizing and so on. They're not trying to convert the world, which gives them a kind of disadvantage when other groups that are trying to proselytize are coming at them. And so, uh, yeah, there's some. uh, Yeah, I think they've got some. I think they understand each other a bit, but not this girl. Indeed. All right. Let me ask you about this. Uh, Have you have you seen this young lady? Uh, Don't recall. This is Rueda Adan. And uh, she actually, I believe, yes, she is passed on to the great beyond. Uh, She was 15 years old. And on August 6th, uh, 2021, she was uh, racing with her friends in a a section of East London called Barking, uh, which I think, well, they're, they're, they're the English go again with these names. But anyway, she's in Barking, East London. And is uh, rented go karts from a, a place called Capital Carts, and she's racing with her friends. Her hijab is hanging out of her helmet and gets caught up in the go kart, and she was strangled to death by her own hijab. Terrible accident, hmm. and uh, we uh, send condolences to the family. But the point of my bringing this up to you, David, right now is that Capital Carts. The go-kart company in Barking has been uh, ordered to pay 120,000 pounds or uh, $150,000 to this woman's family because her hijab was caught up in the uh, workings of the go-kart and she was killed. Now, th- Robert, this reminds me of some other stories from the past. Do you remember these? It was here in the U.S. and there was the... Uh... I forget what it was, a Six Flags or something like that, but some amusement park, some amusement park, and they wouldn't let a Muslim girl, there there was like a Muslim, they were having a Muslim day, 
and they wouldn't let a Muslim girl on the roller coaster with her hijab on because mm -hmm. they said on your head because it can get caught. It could come unraveled with moving around and it gets caught on something and 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 chokes you or, or rips your head off. So That's no. Right. And of course, they were blasted relentlessly in the media for being Islamophobic and for not uh, uh, for not uh, for discriminating against this girl for her Muslim beliefs, not just saying, hey, dangerous things can happen if you're flying around on a roller coaster. And interestingly, that girl who became the uh, poster girl for uh, anti-Islamophobia was eventually honor killed by her Muslim dad. And oh my people, heard, people heard almost nothing about it. But think about this. Uh, you've, got, you've got the amusement park there trying to keep her safe. And the, the penalty for trying to keep her safe and not getting her head ripped off is they're blasted as Islamophobes. Meanwhile, she was actually in much more danger from her dad who killed her. And here we have a different place, a different, uh, completely different place. They let the girl, they let the girl wear her hijab because they don't want to be called Islamophobes. They're terrified. We don't want to be mm -hmm. called Islamophobes. Let them get away with it. We understand these guys are going to jump all over us if we let her, if we let her get, and of course, uh, uh, nope she dies and then they get sued. Look, look at what Islam does. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. If you say, you can't do that here, that's dangerous, you're the bad guy. If you say, okay, I don't wanna be called names, I don't wanna be called racist, I don't wanna be called a bigot, I don't wanna be called an Islamophobe, so you do it how you wanna do it, then you get sued and you're evil for letting this girl die. Yep, that's the, about the size of it right there. And uh, it is incredibly inconsistent. I remember that the Hamas-linked Council on American Islamic Relations fought to get the rules changed so that uh, girls could w Muslim girls could wear hijabs on the roller coasters and they didn't care about the safety uh, issue. And probably we see now why they didn't care about the safety issue because even when a girl is killed because of the lack of basic safety precautions, they still collect and they're still able to blame the uh, manufacturers. It's incredible. Okay, uh, you may remember this fellow on the left. That is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran. Loser. Uh, yeah, you remember him. Yeah, never liked him. Never cared for him much. Um, I, I, I don't know why not. He was such a charmer. Uh, but uh, I, I, I got to find the story here. I had it, but I, I went off it, unfortunately. I got to be... I, I need a secretary, David, I tell you. Um... Anyway, I can't find it, but I can work from memory. Uh, the guy on the right is his exorcist. You mean like on bicycles or something? On bicycles <laughs> and spitting pea soup and heads turning around <laughs> the, the whole nine yards. <laughs> <laughs> that is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's exorcist. Uh, I, can't, I can't find the story because so I can't get his name, but it was a story out of Iran the uh, uh, last week. Oh, there it is. Um, that guy is uh, Abbas Amirafar. And Abbas Amirafar uh, was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's exorcist. And he says that uh, he likes Mahmoud Ahmadinejad very much. And he uh, thought that he was a fine president, a, uh, a, a good president for Iran. And he had the job of protecting him from evil spirits. But nice. he says that uh, Ahmadinejad wants to come back as president of Iran now. And uh, Amir Afar does not support him. Uh, he says that uh, he's changed and that he now supports dancers and homosexuals. Hmm. And as a, <laughs> as a result, the exorcist has withdrawn his support. Hmm. But uh, I just thought, David, isn't that curious? I mean, I, I've never heard of a of a of a world leader having a personal exorcist before. Well, I mean, it explains why things are going so swimmingly well for him this entire time, <laughs> and his country, and his country. I mean, you can see. They I mean, you gotta wonder. Into a... You know, it's 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 an interesting thing because Islam is supposed to be the. Uh, the final religion and the religion, the only true religion and so on. So why would evil spirits have any sway over Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to start with? 
And well, you I wonder. Mean, come on, these things could take out Muhammad, according to Sahil Bukhari. You get a hair from his hairbrush, and he'd be you take him out of commission for uh, six months to to two years. He'd be all <laughs> messed up. Have delusional thoughts and false beliefs, Robert. So who are you to say if the mighty Muhammad was a victim of black magic and magic spells and so on? Why why shouldn't uh, why shouldn't Mahmoud be on his uh, on his uh, on his game? Oh, by the way, yeah. they, they used to in Dearborn, and when I used to go to Dearborn, they had like big billboards for for the gin busters. Oh, yeah. the, the Gin Busters Hotline. You call up, say hello, hello. I got a big one here. <laughs> yeah, can we get the Gin Busters over here? Well, they didn't show up with like proton packs and stuff like that, like the Ghostbusters. They just uh, came in and uh, you know did their little rituals and stuff to exercise the demons. Yeah. Hey, uh, speaking of exercising the demons, uh, I got a story out of Nigeria for you. Nigeria, of course, is beset by jihad activity. We've covered it many mm -hmm. times here. And, Worst place in the world right now. Yeah, absolutely. And there are two primary jihad groups there, uh, three actually, because there are the Fulani, who are uh, always called herdsmen, their tribe of herdsmen in Nigeria, who are, but they're actually Islamic jihadis who are trying to displace the Christians from Nigeria and establish the caliphate and so on. But there's all, there are also two factions of Boko Haram, uh, which means books are forbidden. That is, Western education is forbidden. Uh, Boko Haram split a few years back because uh, part, of them, part of the group joined ISIS and is now the Islamic State West Africa province, ISWAP, whereas uh, the other half did not join the I Islamic State and is just a freelance jihad group. Anyway, the point is that over the last few years, the Nigerian government has been offering sweetheart deals to these guys if they repent. And a lot of Boko Haram jihadis have gone to the government and said, yeah, I'm tired of this jihad, and I realize it's all misunderstanding Islam, and so... Uh, I will take your sweetheart deal. And a lot of them have actually joined the Nigerian army after mm. being deprogrammed. Uh, what do they call it? De-radicalized. De-radicalized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. so uh, what we have out of Nigeria this week is a story of uh, Private Muhammad Adamu. And he was a former Boko Haram member who was de-radicalized, and he joined the 82nd Airborne and Amphibious Division of the Nigerian Army, which I'm sure is a fearsome force. And he uh, has been charged because he stabbed a woman in the barracks in Enugu, Nigeria. He uh, actually slit her throat in the uh, barracks in Nigeria. Uh, why do you think he sp slit her throat in the first place? Why the throat, David? I don't know. Who was she? Because you have a uh, strike at their necks versus. Indeed. We don't know who she was. Uh, the authorities have refused to comment. And there does seem to be reports that they were lovers. But uh, nothing is certain. But in any case, if they were indeed romantically involved and then had some trouble, what might have been the fallout? I understand we're just speculating here. Oh, it could be all kinds of things. Some of these guys just flip out if they get disrespected by a woman. They can't, you know, that's why they throw acid in, in women's faces and so on. Or if he just thinks she's out of line and she's a bad Muslim, he could put her in the apostate category or the uh, something like that and say, I have to kill you as an apostate or a heretic or something. So... Yeah, there are any number of reasons, any number of reasons that uh, a man might, uh, might uh, go for a woman's throat in Islam. Indeed. And so, uh, in any case, it does make me wonder if you had, you know, you, if the repentance was really successful. I mean, you can take the jihadi out of Boko Haram, but can you really take the Boko Haram out of the jihadi? I don't know. And I mean, think about this. Why? Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't these guys take advantage of this uh, idiotic system, right? Oh yeah. What, what are the de-radicalization programs? We've heard we've heard about Muslims before just saying that these things are basically a joke. It's what? What do they do? They, hey, look, right here in the Quran. Uh, 
No compulsion in religion. See, he says it right there. He says it right. No compulsion. In religion. Oh, it's over here. Hey, if anyone killed a man, this is if he's killed all mankind. See, that's the message of the Quran. Don't read anything that came after that. Uh, but that's that's uh, that's good. And there you go. Oh, our hearts have melted. Now we're all about peace and tolerance. Uh, you know, it's you know, it's crazy, bro. It's like all these nations are realizing they've got a they've got a problem with jihad, and so what do they do? They try to. They they try to pretend that Islam is just something that it's not. They try to pretend that these things aren't taught in Islam, which is you're never going to be successful doing that. Yeah, you might you might be a, you might find an idiot who doesn't know anything the Quran says and tell him, oh, it says right there, no no compulsion in religion. He'll go, oh, that's what it says. Okay, I'll believe that then. You might have idiots that this actually works. With. On the whole, it's never going to be successful. You know what? You know what can be successful actually exposing muhammad and the foundations of islam and getting people to have some doubts about whether they want to go out and die for this because they're not sure that it's true not sure that this guy's a prophet what, what what happens when we actually try to do that we're the bad guys we're, we're trying to save all these people we're the bad guys i really should put the book together you know i mean after all i got the critical quran and so i could just take 2 256 there's no compulsion in religion and 532, if you kill one person, this is if you killed all mankind. Put that on page one. And then have like 300 blank pages. Mm -hmm. And put it out. The, the, the Quran, the moderate Quran. The Quran of peace. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you have you know, it. You, you then you have those the, books. Then you'd have the moderate, you've had the moderate Quran and the critical Quran. That, that's yeah, it. Yeah. That's all you need to do. I'll have to, I'll have to ask the publisher if he's interested. Uh, anyway, um... David, a lot of stories still to go. Uh, let me see here. I know I have a picture. It's a very important picture. That, sir, mm. is a ham sandwich. Mm -hmm. That I can I can confirm. And that, <laughs> that is the very ham sandwich, the self same ham sandwich that a uh, Spanish uh, woman who's rather active on Twitter, Ada Yuch. She was uh, eating this ham sandwich on a bus in Spain when a gentleman from Morocco told her that she should stop eating the ham sandwich as tasty as it looks mm -hmm. because it was Ramadan at the time. And uh, no, I'm sorry, this is not a Ramadan story. It's post-Ramadan story. Uh, he, he just objected because it was pork. Hmm. And so Wait, is this, is this, is this, pork, was this was this woman a Muslim? No, no, just a random non-Muslim. On, on, on so a this is you're saying a Muslim objected to a non-Muslim not following Islamic dietary restrictions. You are correct, sir. Can you can you imagine this? You're sitting here with your ham sandwich, right? So we got a ham sandwich. You're sitting there eating it. <laughs> That's a good ham sandwich right there. So God comes along and says, hey. In my religion, you're not allowed to do that. Therefore, you can't do that. What, like, where, where, where do they get this idea that? Isn't it weird? It's like Jews. You got Orthodox Jews, and the, the rules for Jews are the rules for Jews. And you've got Christians, and the rules for Christians are, are for Christians. And you've got Hindus, and the rules for Hindus are for Hindus. You got Islam, and ah, everyone has to follow the ramblings of our illiterate, our our, our illiterate seventh century Arabian caravan robber. Y'all have to follow him. We don't believe in him. Ah, we'll flip out if you don't. Yep. That's it, man. And so I don't know what happened to the ham sandwich. Uh, I hope that uh, that uh, Ada Yuch went ahead and ate it. But the uh, now they got me wanting to go there. Now they got now they got me wanting to go to go over there. Go to Spain every, and eat a ham ride, sandwich on a bus. Every bus ride the same bus, so I run into the same <laughs> guy, and I'm sitting down there with a big old plate of ribs, Robert. A big old plate of ribs, anyway. Yep, yep, some bacon. All right, uh, let's see, is this it? Yeah, this is the Iranian parliament, the Majlis, after they sent all those rockets over to Israel. They were in the parliament. You can see they're shaking their fists and screaming, death to America, death to Israel. But also, and I thought this was interesting, they were also shouting uh, victory to the... Uh, Warriors of Islam, let's see what they say. Congratulations to the Warriors of Islam. Which now, ones? The ones who were fighting against Israel. 
Wait, the ones who are hiding in tunnels like babies? <laughs> That's the ones. The ones who are hiding in tunnels with far four like rats? Yeah. But wait, 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 uh... wait, just to be clear. The, the guys who jump across the border, rape and kill some people, take some hostages, run and hide among civilians and under schools and around hospitals and stuff. And they hide while civilians get caught in the in the crossfire. And that's what they and they do it because that's what they want. These are the super strong guys that we're all supposed to respect. That is correct. Hmm. You're right. But the other thing is the warriors of Islam. Uh, when have you heard anybody say this conflict had anything to do with Islam? Yeah, I thought it was all about uh, land dispute. Exactly. Not about Islam. It's constantly characterized as being a political and not in the slightest degree a religious conflict in the Western media. And yet, whenever the jihadis speak about it, they speak about it in terms of Islam. Strange. Yeah. And in yeah. fact, in fact, you see that way, you see that way more. It's been pointed out. This happens way more when you start looking at uh, looking at what guys are saying in Arabic. The, the leaders and speakers are just are saying in Arabic when they're talking to Western audiences. We don't have a problem with Jews. It's just the Zionists, just the Zionists. And then you see their speeches that are in Arabic, and we will slaughter the Jews. We will end the Jews. The Jews will be destroyed. Just to the Jews. That's it. If I, if I didn't know better, which I don't, I might think they change up their message to appeal to different audiences. Inconceivable. Anyway, uh, David, another story out of this week is in uh, the Gaza Ministry of Health. And the Gaza Ministry of Health is the sole and only source for the number of casualties that we've heard about coming out of Gaza. And so we often hear leftists, protesters, and uh, various politicians and so on saying how terrible it is that 30,000 civilians have been killed by the Israelis in Gaza. And yet the only source for that is the Gaza Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas. But this week, the Gaza Health Ministry, after saying they had 33,091 Palestinian deaths, they admitted that they had been exaggerating and that it was really 20,000. The 12,263 of them were fake. And so that among the 20,000 were, uh, let's see, about 12,000 jihadis. And so actually what you have is a number of civilians killed that compares quite favorably to the num the percentage of civilians killed in Iraq and Afghanistan while the Americans were there. And yet this is supposed to be a genocide. Yeah, there were there were already like uh, war historians and so on who pointed out that the kind of war that Israel's fighting right now, urban warfare, people hiding among civilians, people hiding in civilian areas and stuff like that, uh, people running out and fighting and then running back and hiding among civilians. Uh, it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare because, you know, you're a soldier. You have to go look for some guy. You, people are popping out at you. Uh, if it if someone pops out and he's dressed like a civilian, you don't know if that's a terrorist who just mm -hmm. disguised himself as a civilian. Um, so it's just it's a nightmare situation. Uh, and people were putting even even according to the numbers that Hamas was giving. Israel was doing extremely well, like like actual war. You have you, you have the, the the people screaming on college campuses and so on, but people actually study war. They're like these are, I mean, this is shock. These are shockingly amazing numbers um, for the kind of war that Israel's fighting here. And then if you find out that it's actually better than that, that they're actually that that, that numbers have been exaggerated or something, that's mm -hmm. uh, that's just that's crazy. And what's what's interesting, Robert, is you've got. Uh, the most insane numbers of all time came from Muhammad Hijab. He said he said Israel had a hundred to one, a hundred to one. He said this on Pierce Morgan repeatedly. Israel has a hundred to one civilian to combatant ratio. I hope somebody told him that was a lie. No, they didn't know it because he's he's he does what he always does. He says, "Oh, it's on this article." When oh. when we actually when we actually went to the article, it was about the Hamas leaders. It's a hundred to one ratio of Hamas commanders to civilians, not to Hamas general fighters. He was acting like only a, only a few dozen Hamas terrorists 
had been killed. It was a few dozen Hamas commanders that had been killed. And so he either he he's either so stupid that he can't under. And that, that was in the headline, Robert. He's basing all this on headline that said Hamas commanders. And he took that as any Hamas fighters uh, and came up with his hundred to one ratio. But yeah, it wasn't until no, he got away with it during the show. We looked it up afterwards. Like either this guy can't can't understand a headline, or he did understand it. And he's just a liar. Well, and with a, with the job, you you just can't tell. Is he so yeah. stupid that he doesn't understand a headline, or is he actually just lying about it? Either one would be entirely believable. I think it's incredible how how these guys lie. And uh, I got another one for you. Speaking of lies out of Gaza. Uh, the this is this is actually something that was repeated by the UN Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights, and they reported Mr. Mustafa Ayash, the founder and director of the Gaza Now News Agency, was killed along with at least eight members of his family, including children, in an apparent airstrike on his house. Okay, terrible, right? And this was included. <laughs> in a report about how Israel was killing innocent people and journalists. Because here's this guy from Gaza Now News Agency. Okay, so that was supposed to be on November 22nd. And you can still find it to this day, at this moment, on the UN website that Israel killed Mustafa Ayash. However, David, on March 27th, the United States Treasury Department issued sanctions on people who were helping Hamas. And one of them was Mustafa Ayash, founder and director of the Gaza Now News Agency. And the United States Treasury Department seemed to think that on March 22nd, March 27th, he was alive, even though he had been declared killed on November 22nd. Not only that, but Gaza Now News Agency reported on the day after that the U.S. put the sanctions that Mustafa Ayash had been arrested. And he ain't dead. But he's still listed as killed by Israel on the U.N. website. Well, only one explanation here. It's a miracle. A man is clearly <laughs> raised by Allah to fight another day. That's it. That must be it. What other him, explanation him and, could there be? Yeah, him and Farfour, back from the dead. Yes. Uh, let's see. This is a guy. I couldn't find his name. And I went to the Islamic Center of New Haven's Facebook page and went through months and months of their posts. And I never saw anybody name this guy. But I saw him preaching many times, although... This particular sermon from uh, last November, only recently come to light, uh, has uh, been making the rounds and that they took it down hmm. from the Islamic Center of New Haven Facebook page. Uh, but this is a very uh, a tall, rangy Islamic preacher. If anybody knows his name, his name, know, his name you know? is Sheikh. Dur his name is Sheikh Durka 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 Muhammad Jihad Allah. Everyone oh, that's that. it. That's it. I should have known. Anyway. Um, this guy preaching in the is now taken down sermon from uh, November that just surfaced uh, a couple days ago, actually. He uh, is preaching that the Jews have lowered their standards, that they used to kill prophets, but now they're just killing ordinary people, ordinary humans. But I thought what was most notable about this guy was that he says that we recite, we Muslims recite the seven, the first chapter of the Quran, the Fatiha, 17 times a day in order to be reminded of Allah's anger against the Jews. Hmm. Now, the Fatiha, the opening, the first chapter of the Quran, it ends up, uh, guide us to the straight path, the, uh, the not the path of those who have earned your anger or the path of those who have gone astray. And... Uh, I have it in the critical Quran and have written about it and spoken about it for many years that it's common Islamic tradition yep. commentary on the Quran that the people who've earned Allah's anger are the Jews and the people who've gone astray are the Christians. And that's many, all, many that's Islamic all over, apologists. That's all over their commentaries. It's yeah, all over. Like, but all they, over the place in their they have denied it and said you're just a terrible Islamophobe and so on and so on. 
And yet here's this guy and he just says it straight out. Yeah. Cuz uh, every, Yeah, cuz everyone knows it. Yes. You know you know it's crazy in these uh, a lot of these uh interfaith events where a church will host and have Muslim speakers and stuff, the Muslims will say, hey, why don't we have this united prayer? We'll show you how we pray. And they run them through Surat al-Fatiha and they have Christians yep. praying, not realizing that they're actually cursing themselves and, and saying, don't make us like Christians. Indeed. Yeah, they have no idea. They just did that in, uh, I believe, the New York State House not long ago. But anyway, uh, I have a question in the chat that I wanted to get. Um, characteristically, I can't find it now. But somebody asked, uh, I thought they only prayed five times a day. And that is absolutely yeah. true. Yeah, they recite things multiple times in their prayers. Yes. So they recite the Fatiha. If you go to the five prayers a day, they will recite the first chapter of the Quran, the Fatiha, 17 times in the course of those five daily prayers. Uh, it's kind of like the Lord's Prayer for Muslims, but it's a little bit uglier because it's got these uh, these sort of uh, blanket criticisms of Jews and Christians built into it. Okay, uh, let's see. We have Ahmed Alid in uh, Britain, and he was uh, he he was on trial this past week because he is a uh, He's an asylum seeker from Morocco. Uh, that's not why he was on trial. He stabbed a 70-year-old uh, man on the street in revenge for the alleged Israeli killing of children in Gaza. And so uh, he is on trial now for stabbing the 70-year-old. But I'm not sure. What do you think, David? How does that fix everything in Gaza? Are they still uh, fighting there? <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, kind of uh, yeah, it's kind of stupid. I mean, you know, it's you know, it's messed up. You start off and hey, stab this old guy, and I was thinking, I don't know, some guys, some old people annoy me at the grocery store, so I can kind of get it. And he's like, no, I'm doing it for, I'm doing it for Gaza. I'm like, well, that, that doesn't even make sense, dude. I was like, I understood you. I'm not gonna keep on. I'm not gonna do it. I'm just saying they're old people who are annoying. So if someone actually snapped. I would kind of understand that. So I was kind of like, oh, I get it up until ah, I'm doing it for Gaza. It's like, wait, what? Now you're making now you're making zero sense, dude. You're making zero sense. But this is a this is extreme. I mean, Robert, I mean, th this is so pathetic. It's so insanely pathetic. It's ah, we're all cheering for October 7th. Look what we've done. We're so strong. And then we all know what's happening. We all know they're going to be running and screaming and crying a few days later, which they were. And here we are months later and they're, they're running around and they really thought that, well, if we get a bunch of dumb college students and a bunch of Marxist groups and a bunch of LGBTQ and queers for Palestine, all those guys all marching together. Well, Israel's really not going to go after Hamas then. Uh, no, Israel keeps going after Hamas and they're so insane and desperate. What do they do now? Oh, let's we're setting ourselves on fire and we're stabbing old people to death. It's like, wow, wow, really? Wow, you're really changing my mind, guys. You're really changing my mind, making me think you guys are the sane ones and that we shouldn't, you know, we, we shouldn't be worried about you, Paul. Speaking of dumb college students, oh, that's not them. They were dumb college students earlier, but they're older now. Uh, hang on. Here it is. Uh, these guys were in New York City, and they burned an American flag while chanting Death to America. And I think that the uh, Dearborn Death to America chant it's become a kind of social contagion. And now we're going to see it from a lot of pro-Hamas protesters all over the place in the United States. And I have to say, glad for it. I, I want them to show their true colors. These, these mm -hmm. were, hey, we're, we're not against Jews. We just have a problem with Zionists. We're just concerned with that particular, we're just concerned with the treatment of Palestinians and so on. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're lying. That is a, that is a cover. You have a, you have a much, 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 more uh disgusting agenda than that you're using that to dupe morons uh so it's actually good when their true colors come out indeed all right let's see there's quite a lot more uh that we did not get to i'll give you some real quick there was a, a an isis cell a jihad cell rather in germany uh two boys and four girls david between the ages of 13 and 16. Oh, they were ISIS. I'm sorry. But they were teenagers. The ISIS, 
Der Eis ist jungen. Yes, Eis ist jungen, ja. Und sie war planning to uh, hit churches, bars, a synagogue and a police station in North Rhine, Westphalia. Once again, I think like that kid in Idaho, Alexander Scott Mercurio, they're biting off a little more than they can chew. They think that they're going to be able to just do these multiple attacks on multiple sites without anybody trying to stop them. And think yeah, and you premature. Yeah, you can you can get away with more at certain times, mainly when people are paying attention, when people's guard is down. That's actually what happened in Israel on October seventh. I mean, people weren't even people weren't even showing up because they were thought, hey, it's a holiday, nothing's going on. We've got our fencing, we've got our well, no one's going to be able to do anything to us. And then, nope, nope, uh, they went over, under, and through those fences. But uh, yeah, the the world is basically on pretty high alert right now. Like, like all these different countries are on pretty high alert. Mm -hmm. So if you have a group, if you have three or four or five or six people in your group, much more difficult than if you're just some sort of lone, lone jihadi. Or, you know, it's a, if you like very experienced jihadis understand, like the ones who attacked in, uh, in Russia, they have, uh, they understand, they understand, hey, they understand how to keep their mouths shut and not blurt things out on social media and not how to leak things to friends and not how to run around going, hey, anyone know where I can get a bomb, huh? Come on. They understand that. But the young people, no, they're stupid and they get caught. Yes, indeed. And we can be glad of it. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, some people asked during the course of the hour here uh, why there are no super chats. And that is because I am such a bad guy for opposing jihad violence that I'm demonetized on YouTube. And so uh, please remember, we do have expenses in this, and it actually is getting pretty tight. So if you can uh, support us at jihadwatch.org with a donation or at Patreon, that would be greatly, gratefully received. You got your link? Uh, you, got your, you got the link in the description box? Yeah, the links are there for Jihad Watch and Patreon, and also for the books, The History of Jihad, The Critical Quran, The Palestinian Delusion. Yeah, guys, and there, there's stuff that you can do to uh, support Robert and his right. And guys, keep in mind he's been he's been doing this for decades now. He's one of the he's one of the originals that was trying to warn people, and he's one of the original people who was catching all the fire for years uh, about him spreading uh, bigotry and Islamophobia by just telling people what was in the sources. So uh, he's been doing this a really long time, been catching endless heat. So lots of ways you can uh, you can support Robert. Free ways uh, when you see him uh, posting uh, posting articles and so on on Jihad Watch, visit Jihad Watch and so on. Uh, you can share those articles. Um, if you're on Twitter, uh, share his uh, retweet his tweets and so on. Uh, as, as far as as far as things you would actually buy, definitely you some of his books you, you definitely need. You need a copy of the Critical Quran. Uh, you need a copy of the History of Jihad. Um, given the situation, you need the Palestinian delusion. So there's there, there's those are those are must haves. They should be in all of your libraries. And then, of course, if you can, you definitely want to sign up on, on Patreon. So you got the link right there. Thank you very much, David. And thank mm -hmm. you all for being here. A lot more jihad. Watch out. Keep your head down. But uh, don't let them intimidate you either. And uh, for the next week, we can hope there won't be any jihad. But if there is, then God willing, we'll be back right at this space next week. Until then, pray, hope, don't worry.